Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Introduction to Triple Net Lease Investing. Today we're going to talk a lot about commercial real estate opportunities in commercial real estate and I'm really grateful that you've taken the time to join us on today's call. So let's get started and see some of the great things we're going to talk about today. Today's very important points, really understanding what cap rate is, net operating income, and price, and how those three things work together. Because in commercial real estate, specifically net least commercial real estate, the value of the property is entirely based on those three factors, the cap rate, the net operating income, and the price, and how those three things move around in that algebraic equation. We're going to talk about how to make money in commercial real estate, how to spot a good deal, and we're going to look at uh, some case studies. So first off, this is not legal tax or investment advice, and if you require that kind of advice, uh, contact the appropriately licensed professional. We uh, do do commercial real estate brokerage, but today's event is educational only. There is no uh, broker agency um, relationship created by the nature of this particular webinar. So if you want that kind of agency relationship, you can contact our firm and we can talk about how to represent you in a, a commercial real estate transaction. So we all want more profit with less invested. And in this particular formula, we can see that if we want the return on investment to go up, that's what we want, then the profit should go up or the money, time, and hassle need to go down. And that's one of the core keys of our particular brand, hassle-free cash flow investing, is making the amount of time and hassle that you put into your investments go down, which makes your profit go up. So assuming your profit stayed the same and your amount of money you put in was less, the time that you put in was less, the hassle was less, then your return on your money goes up and that's really what we're trying to help our, our clients achieve. So let's talk about real estate profit centers specific to commercial real estate. And this some of this is going to be very similar to residential real estate, but then there's also going to be some differences. And let's go through uh, this, this particular uh, checklist. So the first thing we're going to talk about is cash throw off from rental income. And very simply, the tenants pay you rent, you pay all the expenses, including your mortgage, and this is what you get to keep off, keep. So cash throw off is different than net operating income. The property's value is based upon net operating income, but if you don't get to keep any of that net operating income, that isn't a, a, a profit center of cash throw off, right? So another way to say that is if you're investing specifically for cash flow, hassle-free cash flow investing, the CTO or cash throw-off is what you get to keep. And don't confuse cash throw-off with net operating income because they're, they're very different. Equity growth from loan amortization, very similar to a residential property in that the amount of money that your tenants pay to make your loan smaller is equity growth from loan amortization. And a very key point is that your tenants must be paying down your loan for this to be considered a profit center. If you take your own money from work or from savings and you pay down your loan, that isn't a profit center. Your loan might be amortizing, but it isn't a profit center. The other uh, way to make money in real estate, generically, is tax savings from depreciation. The idea of a tax write-off versus a tax shelter, right? A tax write-off is you spend a dollar and you get 30 cents off or 30 cents back. A tax shelter is you spend nothing and you get a dollar deducted from your gross income on your, 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 your income tax bill. And through the depreciation of the real estate, we're able to show a phantom loss, meaning you might get a dollar in your bank account, but you might only report to the IRS that you earned 60 or 70 cents. And that uh, reduction in the income uh, creates a tax savings for you, but it's actually a phantom reduction. I've heard people say, well, I want to earn less so that I pay less in taxes. And that's just really stupid. 
no one wants to earn less, right? You just want to pay less in taxes. And if you can show your bank account getting bigger by a dollar, and you can legally show the IRS that you only earned 60 cents because you get this phantom write-off through depreciation, that's what's magical about, about real estate. The other key point we're talking about is equity growth from appreciation. In residential real estate, oftentimes people look at appreciation as someone's willing to pay more on a price per square foot or a price per bedroom for my my house, right? Just the square footage prices went up because there's more demand or there was less uh, supply and demand was consistent or um, we had... Um, you know, another profit center that we're not going to talk about is just inflation. The, the, the currency devalued, and so the price of everything went up, including uh, your property. That Those are all equity forms of equity growth from appreciation. But in commercial real estate, what we see in terms of equity growth is called cap rate compression. And cap rate compression is another name for appreciation in commercial real estate. Cap rate compression is when an investor's expectation for a return goes down. They say, well, I'm willing and happy to take a 1% return on my money by buying a CD, right? If you would have looked, you know, even five years ago at where certificate of deposit rates were, nobody would have been happy with 1%, right? They would have shopped and shopped and shopped till they found a bank that would give them 2 or 3%. Now, if your bank offers you anything for interest, you're probably happy. And so that what happened was the expectation for yield and interest rates went down. In commercial real estate, cap rates are at all-time highs. And so it's a very weird phenomena in our economy, economy right now where interest rate expectations are low. People are willing to lend their money either to individuals or lend their money to banks at very low interest rates. But if you're going to be investing in commercial property, People want a very high rate of return. So cap rates are high, interest rates are low, and that is a perfect storm. And one of the ways that we make money in commercial real estate is by cap rate compression. So here is the formula that the cap rate on a property equals the net operating income divided by the price. So if the net operating income is $10,000 and your price is $100,000, then the cap rate is 10. And cap rate is a percentage, but we never say 10% cap rate. So just put on your, your uh, local vernacular hat and realize if you're talking real estate, you're going to say a cap rate as a 10 cap. But when you do the math in your calculator, it's going to be 0.1, right? Or 10%. So let's look at this formula. If the cap rate goes up, then the price goes down. So as a buyer, we want a high cap rate right? We want to pay less to get that income stream. So as a seller, obviously you want the flip. You want low cap rates and high prices. And so cap rate and price move in inverse directions, assuming that the net operating income stays the same. So in this particular slide, if the price goes down and the net operating income stays the same, then the cap rate goes up. As a buyer, we want high cap rates. As a seller, we want low cap rates. And so what's great about today's market for buying is prices in commercial real estate have somewhere to go, right? A few years ago, cap rates were at all-time lows. And so if you bought a property at a low cap rate, the price couldn't go anywhere but down because the cap rate was already so low. Right now, Cap rates are so high historically that if investor confidence returns and cap rates go down, prices will go up relative to the income. What people are afraid about right now is that net operating incomes will go down, but the cap rates will stay the same. And so if your net operating income goes down because of your tenants can't pay the rent or your tenants want a discount on the rent or your expenses go up and your income stays the same, then all of those reduce your net operating income. And if your cap rate expectation stays the same and your net operating income goes down, then the price goes down. So this is just a good, in moving these three parts around is how we make money in commercial real estate. Here we are. If the cap rate goes down and the income stays the same, the price will go up. 
For example, if our $10,000 net operating income stays the same, and in, if investors, instead of paying a 10 cap for the property, are willing to bid that income at an 8 cap, or they're willing to pay more to get that income stream, then the price goes up. And so these three uh, pieces, price, net operating income, and cap rate, move in a circle together. The other thing is equity growth from rent increases. And so what we talked about is that if your income goes up and your cap rate stays the same, then the value of your property goes up. And so if you know that your income can go, can go up for a lot of different reasons, maybe your tenant is renting below market rate and when their lease rolls, you can raise their rent. Maybe you've got a long-term tenant with rent increases built into their lease. That's another great way uh, to build in price appreciation because as that rent goes up and cap rates stay the same, your property is worth more money and that's an exciting thing. Another way that we make money in all real estate and in commercial real estate as well is arbitrage. And one of my fundamental rules about investing is that your cap rate must be greater than your interest rate, meaning if you are earning an 8% return from the property, so owning the property free and clear pays you an 8% return, that's an 8 cap rate, and you can borrow money at 5% from the bank or from an investor or for whoever, then you're making a 3% profit on the bank's money. The way that we really make money in real estate is not necessarily the property, it's from the leveraged property because an 8% return is nice but when you look at I can borrow four parts of that purchase price from the bank and one part of the purchase price is my money another way to say that is 20% down but we're gonna say that four per times four um, parts of the purchase price are from the bank one part of the purchase price is from you then you've got uh, leverage you've got five to one leverage one part your money to five parts property and if you're making three percent spread on the bank's money you're basically making the four parts of the bank's money times three percent you're making a twelve percent return on the bank's money and you're making an eight percent return on your money so you add them together suddenly you're making a twenty percent return on investment and I went through that kind of quick so I'm going to say that one more time if the part of the property that is just your money is making 8%. The part of the property that is the bank's money is making 3% or that spread between what you earned and what you borrowed it at. And because four parts of that property are purchased using bank's money, four times three is 12%, and then you add that to the 8% return, which is what your money, your cash is earned. And so that arbitrage is what really makes real estate magical. You went from an 8% profit to a 20% profit, and it didn't have anything to do with the property. It had to do with your financing structure on the property. So lease renewal. When a property is leased at a very long term, investors will pay a lower cap rate. If you say, look, this is a 99-year lease to the federal government, that lease is so long-term and so simple that an investor will pay a very low cap rate compared to saying, look, this is Joe's Bakery and they just opened their shop today and they're on a month-to-month -month lease, right? An investor to buy Joe's Bakery on a month-to-month -month lease, they're going to want a higher cap rate to compensate for risk than if they were to uh, go for a very long-term tenant lease. And on that same point, the stronger the tenant, the lower the cap rate. And so if it's Joe's Coffee, that's a higher cap rate than if it were Starbucks, right? Because Starbucks is a stronger tenant, people will pay more to get that income stream, which makes the cap rate lower. Another way we make money is through forced equity from improved tenancy or development. For example, one of the projects that some of my partners and I put together is we bought a vacant building and we paid a certain price for that vacant building. But when we added a tenant to that building, 
it created income, and that income made the property worth more money. The other thing we can do with that same property is we started with an 8,000 square foot property, and we're adding on additional square footage to make it a 20,000 square foot property. And when we add that additional square footage, we create more income from the property, and that income means that we can sell the property at a higher price. And when we're looking at the feasibility of uh, cost of development versus the income it can produce, you know, a good formula is, let's say it costs us $200 a square foot to build this particular property, and we can rent it at $20 a square foot, then what we're looking at, or and when I say rent it at, $20 a square foot, net, 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 meaning our net operating income after expenses is $20, then what we have is a 10 cap property, right? $20 of income divided by $200 cost of construction gives us a 10 cap property. And I know that this particular property in this particular marketplace, because of all of the uh, ways that we value cap rate, should sell at an 8 cap. And so if I can get that cap rate compression, build it at a 10 cap, sell it at an 8 cap, then I know that that forced equity is my profit, and that's what's exciting. So let's talk about how we evaluate a particular triple net deal. Triple net leased properties, and net 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 leased means it's net of uh, operating expenses, um, such as maintenance, net of property taxes, and net of insurance. And so net net net, or triple net, is a way of saying, here's what's left over after you pay all of the expenses on the property except for debt service. So your triple net is the income that's left over to the landlord after they pay everything except for uh, your, uh, your, your mortgage. There's a couple deviations in that. Most people selling triple net lease properties will fail to put in a vacancy reserve, they'll fail to put in the cost of management, and they'll fail to put in a replacement reserve. I put those things in to my performers, but when you're looking at net leased properties on the marketplace and you see, you know, this is an eight cap property, you can ask yourself, did they add in the expense of management? Did they add in the expense of replacement reserve? Did they add in the expense of vacancy? And the answer is going to be usually no, right? Which So if you add those things in, then your net operating income goes down and your cap rate goes down. So the reason someone wants to buy a triple net leased property is ease of management and they're buying an income stream. And so when we're trying to figure out what cap rate do we pay for that income stream, it has to do with durability of income. And so the cap rate is another way of saying how valuable is your property, right? So let's say gold we can say is $1,500 an ounce. I, I don't know what it really is, but I'm making that up. And so silver is $30 an ounce. Again, I'm not sure what spot price is today. I'm just using it as an example. But let's say one ounce of gold is not the same as one ounce of silver. So we can't measure the value of those two things necessarily in ounces. And we can't really measure it in uh, dollars. We have to measure it in dollars per ounce. We have to have both of those metrics to figure out how much that metal is worth. And this is how we measure um, income property is based on cap rate. So a lower cap property is usually a more densely, uh, it's more concentrated form of value, and a higher cap property is a looser form of, uh, of value or less con condensed form of value. And so a six cap property is oftentimes a, a sexier property. It's usually nicer, it's newer, it's in a uh, more densely populated area. Um, and your quality of tenant is going to be higher. A higher cap property might be more rural. The, the income uh, might be a little bit more suspect, right? The demographics for releasing that property might not be as good. There might not be very many people in that market. Uh, the, so when we're looking at durability of income, let's just start, start at the 12 o'clock and work around this slide uh, clockwise. So I look at the releasing income potential. Your tenant will always leave you. It doesn't matter who your tenant is, the tenant will always leave. 
And if they don't, you're, you're lucky. You're an anomaly. And so when you're buying the property, it's important to look at what the income is now because that's what you're paying for. But you don't want to pay too much knowing that your tenant is going to leave you. You know, I was looking at uh, a triple net leased Rite Aid property and I liked everything about it except for Rite Aid was paying $30 a square foot triple net and the market value was only $20 a square foot triple net. And I knew that when the Rite Aid lease was up, albeit it was only it was 15 years left on the lease, that's a long lease, but when that Rite Aid lease was up, I didn't think that I could re-rent the property for the same uh, income. I thought I was going to have to take a huge discount on that, that rent to get it re-rented. Even if it's renegotiating with your existing tenant, they're going to want to re-rent the property at uh, market rates when their lease rolls. So some people get very excited when they see a very high cap rate, not realizing that one of their big risk factors is the tenant is overpaying for rent. So when you're looking at commercial property and someone says this property is rented above market rates, that is not an exciting point, that's a risk factor, that's a red flag to say, uh-oh, right? I'm getting a premium, but only for a certain period of time. The next thing to look at is lease term. If you can set it and forget it, that has value. You've lowered the hassle in the property. So the longer that term is, the more of a premium someone will pay for that property. Some investment strategies that I've taken on is looking at a property that might be a high cap rate. For example, I bought a shopping center at a nine cap rate. And my partners and I bought this shopping center with only three years left on the uh, the tenant lease. And I looked at the uh, the sales numbers for this property. I looked at the location of the property and the, what they were paying for rent. And I felt very confident that this tenant was going to renew their lease. Is it a risk that they would leave? Absolutely. There, there's all kinds of risks in real estate. What we're looking at as an investor is making educated risks. So I took the educated risk along with some key partners to buy this property at a high cap rate with only three years left on the lease. What happens is once that lease goes past three years and we re get into what's called the renewal portion of the lease, there was a 10 year renewal. And so once this property got to the beginning of its 10 year renewal, so there was 10 years left on the lease rather than three years, that property would suddenly trade at a lower cap rate, which means a higher price, and that higher price was a potential profit center for us. And so we looked at that short-term lease as a potential uh, risk reward. Let's take the short lease knowing that when it rolls to the long-term lease, we can sell the property at that point and make a profit. Right? The other thing is when we're putting together some of our multi-tenant property deals as a developer, we want to make sure that our leases don't all roll over at the same time. Right, right now, my partners and I are developing a medical office building, and we don't want all of the leases to come due at the same time because if they all the tenants leave at the same time, you've got a vacant building, and a vacant building is hard to fill. There's no synergy, right? But if you can get 20 or 30 percent of your leases to roll over in a good given year, then you've got 70 or 80 percent of the center full. And that means that you can use that momentum to go out and attract new tenants. So that lease term is really key in determining the value. Because if someone is going to buy your property and they see all of the leases rolling over at the same time, they're going to put a higher cap on your property to compensate for that risk, which means less proceeds of sale for you as a, as a seller. The other thing we're looking at is cost of tenant improvements, both to start with and also when you go re-rent the property. You know, for example, if your tenant spent a lot of money making that property fit their very specific use, right? Um, maybe they're a themed restaurant, and a themed restaurant put a million dollars into that particular box to make it look like a jungle, right? Uh, and so that restaurant is, on one hand, less likely to leave you because they can't take that million dollars of tenant improvements with them to the next location. They're going to have to leave it behind. That's a potential benefit in the durability of that income. On the flip side, if that tenant um, 
does leave you and you go to put your property on the market, you can market, you know, looking for a jungle themed restaurant and that's the only thing that your property is suitable for, you, you've got a very small slice of the tenant market that would look at your particular property. If you find that person, you might get a windfall. You might get a huge uh, amount of rental income because that new tenant will pay a premium for those specialty tenant improvements. However, if you wind up getting someone saying, look, I, I like this particular uh, location, I like the, the box, I like everything about it except for our restaurant isn't jungle themed, you know, I would like to use this to put in a shoe store. Well, those million dollars of tenant improvements have no value to the shoe store, right? So the shoe store is going to have to rip out all those specialty improvements and then build it back to a more vanilla type of shell, a more generic shell. So when I'm looking at uh, properties that I want to own, I don't mind if the tenant is a specialty tenant, but what I want to make sure is that if I go to re-rent that property, that the physical nature of that property is generic enough or the cost of re-improving that property for the new tenant uh, makes economic sense. So uh, for that reason, I, I particularly like mid-box um, stores, you know, things that are eight to 10,000 square feet. That's a very nice size box to get uh, re-rented. Uh, when you have a 160,000 square foot vacant big box store, the only person who's going to go in there is another big box store. And if the first big box failed, the second big box is unlikely to come in. When you have an 8,000 square foot store, there's a, a ton of available tenants for that space. And if it's kind of a generic looking building with generic improvements, then the durability of income is higher or the cost of improvements for your next tenant is going to be lower. Also, we're looking at demographics. The tenant wants people and he wants those people to have a certain income bracket, right? It doesn't matter what it is as long as those demographics match your tenant. Some demographic, some tenants want very affluent people. Some tenants want very low income uh, households to serve. Whatever the property is, you want to make sure that it serves those demographics. Obviously, the more people there are within your trade area, the trade area is drawing rings around your property, you know, one mile, three mile, 10 miles, sometimes they do it by time. You know, what's who's how many people within a five minute radius, 15 minute radius, and a 30 minute radius, and how far people will drive to that particular tenant uh, changes how big their trade area is. For example, the trade area of Disneyland is enormous. People come from all over the globe to go to Disneyland. The trade area of the Subway sandwich shop uh, in your town is probably only a few minutes, right? People aren't going to drive half an hour to go to Subway Sandwich Shop, but they might drive, you know, 30 hours to go to Disneyland. So the demographics are very important. The more people there are, the more valuable your property is. Generally, the higher income uh, area that, that, that it is, tenants will pay a higher price or a higher rent to tap into those higher income demographics. Also, what's the upside potential of this particular uh, property? For example, if you're buying it below uh, market rents, people might pay a slight premium to be below market rents, but they'll pay a discount if it's above market rents because they they have to price in that risk into the, the property. Also, upside potential for reuse. We talked about maybe you've got... Um, a, a property that you could buy and it's rented to Joe's coffee shop, but you really know that Starbucks would go great in that shop. You could wait till Joe's coffee shop's lease is up and go re-rent it to Starbucks by changing that uh, quality of tenant. There's some upside potential in that, that particular property. When we're looking about the property's attributes as it relates to expenses, usually a triple net lease, um, the tenant pays all of the expenses, but there's some carve outs, right? So sometimes your tenant says, we're going to pay for all of the expenses. It's a triple net lease. But then you read the fine print and it says, well, we're going to pay for everything except for roof and structure. And we'll pay for parking lot, but only up to $2,000 a year, right? So 
you've got to read that lease document very carefully to determine what the durability of income is. And um, when you're looking at the property, you say, look, I really like this particular property, but there's this uh, drainage problem, right? And so when the water comes in, you know, maybe we have to go add some new uh, drainage um, uh, ditches to the property to, to control uh, runoff. Or maybe... Um, your tenant right now is triple net lease, but when you go to get a new tenant, um, that particular tenant only wants a gross lease, meaning that the landlord pays the expenses. Then the landlord has to look at what the cost of maintaining that property is. Are there expensive landscaping areas? Are there expensive common areas to uh, light and to clean, right? The reason shopping malls, indoor shopping malls, are a dying breed is because the cost to heat and cool those common areas is insanely expensive, right? A giant mall might spend a million dollars or more a month just cleaning, heating, and cooling the hallways. And if you're a tenant in that shopping center, you have to pay for that. And you don't want to necessarily have to pay to heat and cool and clean a common area versus if you're in what they call now a power center, which is an outdoor center, um, where maybe there's a big anchor store and there's a bunch of small stores, but it's not enclosed. Those outdoor malls have lower operating expenses, and that's what tenants are moving towards because it's cheaper to rent there, and that's what is kind of driving development now is those outdoor shopping centers. Um, and it's because those, those operating expenses are so much lower. The other thing is financing availability. Some tenants will qualify for loans, and some tenants won't. So if I go to my lender and I say, I would like to buy this particular property and the tenant has a strong financial statement and there's a long-term lease in place and the property is fairly generic, I can get a good loan from my bank to buy that property at a long-term fixed interest rate. If I go to my bank and say, look, you know, this tenant's really sketchy, they're, they're not really profitable, uh, they're just hanging in there by the skin of their teeth, and they didn't personally guarantee the lease, and uh, they're, they're just month to month, and by the way, it's a very specialized, uh, very specialized use, um, my bank isn't going to give me any money to buy that property. And so if there's no financing available for the property, the price will have to be lower to compensate to attract an all-cash buyer, right? So when you're looking at which tenants do you want to own, the ability to get financing is a, is a big, big deal. The other thing is tenant and industry strength, right? Um, if your tenant is in an industry that is going out of business, then you're unlikely to want that particular that particular tenant, right? Um, Tenants, you know, in the luxury market, right? If your tenant is, does jewelry and they do um, very high-end luxury items, that part of the economy is weakening right now. And so the properties that are tenanted by luxury item tenants, they should be trading at a higher cap rate to compensate for that risk. The opposite is true. At the lower end of the market, things like dollar stores, Dollar Tree, 99 cent store, Dollar General, Family Dollar, that end of the economy is growing and those businesses are more profitable. More and more people are shopping at the low end of the spectrum than the high end of the spectrum. Those tenants and their industry is strengthening and lenders are more willing to be aggressive on a loan. You know, I was stunned when I got a bank quote to provide 85% loan to purchase price financing to buy a dollar, uh, a family dollar, uh, single tenant leased uh, property. That's usually unheard of. Usually in commercial, you need uh, 25 to 35% as a down payment. Here's a lender willing to let me into the property for 15% down. And it's because they really, really like the tenant and they think their industry is strengthening and the lease is a very long-term lease. So by the time that lease is up, the lender is at a very low loan to value. So durability of income, all of those factors that we looked at, they impact the market cap rate. So when you say, what is my property going to sell for? Or what should I pay to buy the property? It's very subjective, 
right? All of those bullet points that we looked at, these are all subjective. Every buyer and seller is going to value each of these points on the clock differently. And so when you're looking at the, uh, the value of the cap rate, you have to just decide what it is worth to you. So let's look at some case studies. This is a very specific uh, family dollar property that was on our income property showcase last week. And I really like this particular property. I am uh, very considering buying this property and uh, uh, for my own portfolio or to syndicate with some partners. Um, some things about this particular property, it's in a high visibility location. The amount of cars that drive by it on a daily basis is high. And so a tenant is going to want to pay a premium to get those particular eyeballs, right? One thing to, to consider is which side of the street gets the most traffic. For example, some streets, it's very high traffic northbound, but it's low traffic southbound. Or maybe it's uh, you know high traffic northbound in the morning and high traffic southbound in the afternoon, right? Some tenants, like a coffee shop, will pay a premium to have the morning traffic. So if you are leasing to a, 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 a coffee place or a breakfast restaurant, they want to be on the side of the street where people can make a quick uh, right turn into their parking lot in that time of day that is favorable to their business. So in this particular uh, property, you, you know, if the traffic is highest in the afternoon on the side of the street that you're on, then a retail tenant might be more or likely to, to rent your space or to pay a premium for that kind of traffic. If you have to make a left-hand turn into a parking lot, you're less likely to go there. And so that's just an interesting thing about uh, egress and uh, accessibility. The best uh, locations are usually what are called hard corners, where you can make a, uh, a, a it's at an intersection, a controlled intersection, and it's a lot easier to get into because you can get egress from two different streets. And even if you're coming from an opposite direction, because of that controlled intersection, you can usually get into that, uh, that parking lot fairly, fairly easy. The tenant is investment grade. In this particular case, it's a family dollar, which is a publicly traded Fortune 500 company. And people will pay a premium to have an investment grade tenant. There's also built-in rent increases in the lease. So this lease goes out another eight years, and sometime during the next eight years, there's going to be rent increases. And as we know, as the rent goes up, the value of the property goes up as well. So when you're looking at the geographic information, you want to know how many people are in the area, uh, what kind of um, uh, income those people make, et cetera, and is that consistent with the kind of tenant that you're looking for. In this particular case, I like that this property is on the main um, highway through town, but it's also just a block or two off the interstate. Those are good things for traffic. Good visibility from the hard corner, those are all things that are important. In this particular case, let's look at the particular financial information. Purchase price of $678, gross rent of $5,600, and that is triple net. And so there are all of the expenses for this property, such as taxes, insurance, the most of the maintenance on the property is taken care of. Um, in this particular performa, family dollar usually doesn't pay for roof and structure. So in this case, the roof has a, a, a long-term warranty on it, but at some point that warranty is going to wear off or that warranty has a deductible attached to it um, and you may have to put some money into maintaining that roof. Um, the interesting thing about triple net lease investing is someone can say, David, I really believe the Family Dollar is a great company. I think they're going to be profitable in the future. Well, here's their stock price over the last five years. And clearly, the marketplace, the stock market, has said, yes, we think that this tenant is going to do well. Because as the recession intensified, their stock went up because they served that lower income part of the market. And so in this particular situation, their stock went from $20 to almost $80 over a five-year period. You know, congratulations to those investors who were in. They were making an excellent, excellent return. But the next question is, what are, is their stock going next? And I don't know. 
I don't know where the stock is going next. Maybe their, all of their good fortune and profitability has already been priced into the price of their stock. And so where, whether the stock goes up or down, nobody knows. But if you're their landlord, meaning you're, they have given you a guarantee of rental income. They say, we promise to pay this rent. And if you don't, all of the assets of the company are exposed to that, uh, to that obligation to pay rent. And so I am confident that this tenant will pay rent for the duration of the, that lease period, right? And so when I'm looking at stock investing versus real estate investing, I'm much more likely to um, have a more guaranteed return. For example, in the illustrations that we were looking at earlier, you could potentially make uh, you know, a return in the high teens. You know, eight, 17, 18% is potentially possible open, owning triple net lease properties. And why would you take the risk of owning a stock when you could actually be that, that company's landlord? Also, if this tenant eventually leaves, you have a building, right? You can go do something with that particular building. So let's move on. This is an unusual down payment situation. There's a local bank that has said they'd like to make an aggressive loan on this property. So here's what the property looks like from a cash throw off perspective, right? And remember, in commercial property, you're gonna have a 25 year uh, amortization is very common. So your more money is going to pay down the mortgage than say in a residential property. Also, the depreciation schedule on commercial property is longer. So a house will typically depreciate at 27 and a half years and a commercial property will typically depreciate at 39 years. So when you're depreciating a property over a longer period of time, you get uh, the same amount of tax benefit, but you have to wait longer to get it. And so uh, the commercial property has a slightly lower tax advantage than does a residential uh, property. So in this particular case, I'm looking at the net operating income. I've expressed it here monthly, but more commonly in commercial real estate, we look at net operating income on an annual basis, an annualized basis. And this is what the cash flow looks like on this particular property. So how do you make money with this property? Um, spendable cash flow, getting that leverage at, at low, low interest rates. You know, for example, um, when inflation happens, you know, in my opinion, it's not a if, it's a when. When inflation happens and you can borrow this money, maybe you borrow half a million dollars, and that half a million dollars represents 20 Toyota Camrys, right? So you have an obligation to repay your lender 20 Toyota Camrys. Let's say 10 years from now, a Toyota Camry now costs $50,000 rather than $25,000. Assuming you had an interest-only loan, you could repay that debt with 10 Toyota Camrys rather than 20 Toyota Camrys. So by being a borrower, you're able to control the currency through a period of time when inflation happens and you can repay that debt with cheaper dollars. So this property gives you the ability to borrow money and the tenant uses your property and pays you rent. And that rent is what allows you to control that debt through a period of time. So also your tenants pay down the mortgage. There's tax benefits from depreciation. Rent increases. Once that rent goes up, the property should be worth more. We talked about cap rate compression. If you're buying this property at an eight and a quarter cap rate and investors suddenly become willing to pay an eight cap or seven and a half cap, then people will pay more for the same amount of income stream. The other thing is a property like this is simple. You can really very simply own and manage this property. It is not that complicated. When, if you wanted to acquire a property like this, it's a great resume builder you, to say, look, I, you know, for half a million bucks, you get into commercial real estate and um, half a million dollars is not really it. It's $150,000 cash and then you get into a property. And it's a great opportunity to get friends and family together to go own a property because the income is strong, the upside is strong. So let's look at a different property. This is a double net lease post office. The difference between triple net lease and double net lease. A double net lease is a more honest way of saying the landlord's gonna pay something, but not everything, right? So the three nets are maintenance, insurance, and taxes. In this particular situation, the tenant pays for the maintenance 
and they pay for the taxes, but they don't pay the cost of insurance, right? So you've got to budget into your uh, net operating income the cost of insur uh, insurance. Right now, uh, so let's just look at the property. Um, leased for another five years. It's the highest producing post office in the county. It's located in the central business district of a rural county. There are not a lot of people in this particular area, maybe 20,000 people in the county. Um, but it's located in the downtown next to the sheriff's office, the city hall, the county government agencies, the, um, uh, a lot of businesses that support the government functions uh, at the county level. Um, pretty generic sized building. I like that it's 4,200 square feet. Another thing that I look at in evaluating a commercial property is the ratio between rentable square footage and parking spaces. So in this particular case, there's 4,200 square feet and there's 3,600 parking spaces. So we would divide you know, 4,200 square feet by 36 parking spaces and you get roughly um, one parking space for every 150, 160 uh, square feet of property. What that means, it's a very high parked user. There's a lot of parking available per square footage. What's more common is one parking space for every uh, 400 square feet. Some I've seen some as low as um, one parking space for uh, every 100 square feet, but that that's very very rare. That's like a uh, a, a call center or some type of a um, very dense in, in employer, right? Um, but here we are, one, one parking space for every 160 square feet. You can put almost any use imaginable into that particular space. It could be a doctor's office. It could be child care. It could be a school. It could be um, uh, retail. It could be professional office. It could be government services, right? A lot of things that that building could be. When I look at the picture of that property, my first thought isn't, oh, my gosh, if that's not a, a gas station, what else am I going to put in it? Right? It's a very generic uh, use. I like that. Uh, there's also a loading dock you can see on the right hand side. That's good for a retail user, right? A doctor's office might use it as an ambulance bay, right? So there's a couple you know, functional uses for uh, that, that particular docking bay. This property is trading at a high cap rate right now because there's a lot of media exposure regarding will the post office go out of business? And that becomes your personal investment philosophy. How likely is the post office going to likely to go out of business? And if they do, can you get that property re-rented for the current market rent? So this particular property is leased at about $12 a square foot double net. And on a national perspective, that's a good rent, right? On a local perspective, you just have to look and see how much would I rent this property for if it were to go vacant? In a small market, there aren't very many data points, and so you have to be a little bit more subjective uh, on determining uh, what your rental rates are. But a nine and a half cap rate to have a pretty vanilla, generic looking building that's less than 20 years old with five years left on it with an investment grade tenant such as the post office, I think that's a pretty extraordinary cap rate. I think the way that you make money on this particular property is buying it, waiting for the economy to improve or the post office's um, public relations impression to improve, and then uh, the cap rate should go down, which would make the price go up. This is a very bite size, or I'll, I'll sometimes call this a snackable size property. For commercial property to get into for half a million bucks, uh, is, is, is pretty bite size. You know, there's a lot of commercial properties at a much, much higher, uh, price point than that. 15% cash throw off, unbelievable cash throw off, right? The cap rate on this particular deal was, uh, a nine and a half cap, but because of that widespread between the interest rate and the cap rate, we're getting an excellent cash throw off. Uh, for this particular property. This could be a great arbitrage opportunity. If you've got the ability to pull equity out of your property, maybe your primary residence, you can pull the money out at, at three and a half or four percent, and you can go invest that for 15 percent cash throw off. Remember, that's not total return. That's just one of the eight or nine ways that we talked about making money in real estate. But the cash throw off is what gives you the cash flow to either live on right, because it's net spendable to you, or to service other debt that you've taken out to um, 
to pay for this particular property, right? Some of the properties might have a very high return, but the cash throw off is low. And if you've arbitraged your way into that by borrowing money out of property A to purchase property B, you want to have a generous amount of cash throw off to go service the debt on the property that was the source of your down payment. So how do you make money owning this? Um, rental income, very simply, you could just set it, forget it, say 15%, that's enough for me, let me just be happy with that. The other is um, you can borrow money at historically low fixed interest rates. There's the opportunity for more aggressive lending on this particular property from terms of uh, you. there's non-recourse money available. So if you wanted to go buy this property and you've got bad credit or bad income, uh, if you've got a large enough down payment, you could buy this with non-recourse, probably 40 to 50% down to get non-recourse, but it would be available, right? The other thing is uh, some people have short sales or foreclosures on their credit, but they still have a high FICO, they still have good cash, and they still have um, a lot of great attributes of being a, a, a borrower, um, but because of that short sale, they can't get... Um, they can't get a, uh, um, a loan through Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. When you're looking at commercial real estate, oftentimes the, the lending requirements are a little bit more uh, liberal because they're looking at the property's ability to generate income and service the debt rather than you as the borrower. Um, we had some questions come up. Do you really need to budget for management fees in a triple net lease property? Uh, yes and no, right? It takes me maybe a couple hours a month to manage um, the, the triple net leased properties, right? You've got income and expenses and what's called common area maintenance bill back on a multiple tenant property. So in multiple tenant properties, you've got four tenants, let's say, and each pays 25% of the expenses. The landlord pays the expenses. Then you bill each of those tenant 25% of their the cost of whatever the expense was. So it's a pass-through. You ultimately don't pay it as a landlord, but there's an administrative cost to that. In a single tenant property, like the post office that we showed in the family dollar, I agree that you probably don't need to put a management fee in that particular property because um, the tenant takes care of everything themselves and there's no common area maintenance bill back to, uh, to put together. Um, but occasionally you'll still you know, want to drive by the property and make sure that things are going okay. Um, maybe if it's not you, you can hire someone to drive by you know, at once or twice a year to take a photo just to make sure it's still there, et cetera. Um, so uh, another great opportunity for this property, um, which is reuse, maybe a doctor's office would pay more for this property than the post office, right? Medical office rates are generally higher than generic uh, properties, and there's a hospital nearby this property. Maybe if, I don't know this to be true, but it's possible that if the post office moved out, you could convert it to medical office, and instead of getting $12 a foot, you might get $15 or $18 a foot uh, for the property. I don't know if that's true. That's just a possibility to, to explore. Um, cap rate compression is definitely possible, and the opportunity to bring partners together to buy this property is great. When the property is more unique and the property takes more cash to buy and people are a little bit more uh, afraid of something because they don't understand, then it's a good syndication opportunity because you can aggregate capital in smaller bites. You can be the, the um, mastermind manager of saying, look, I know how to handle this uh, particular tenant. If it goes vacant, I know how to handle the construction and finding a new tenant and doing the leasing, etc. cetera. Um, those are great opportunities for syndication. So today was a whirlwind presentation, and I hope that everyone got some great educational nuggets out of today. That was the entire point, is for this to be an educational event. Uh, the way that our company makes money is we connect people like you to income properties. And so if you're interested in owning a commercial property or any type of an income property, um, and you're looking to do it in a hassle-free experience where we can do some pre-screening for you and just bring you the types of properties that you're very interested in, I really encourage you to send us an email uh, and let us know that you're interested in owning that kind of a property. There's also a great survey on our website at hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com 
click on the tab that says investments and there's a survey that you can use to fill out what your uh, types of investment property that you're interested in and that'll go into our database and when we have properties that fit your criteria we can let you know all right we don't send our properties out to our blanket list we only send properties to people who said they're interested in property and they've told us what kind of property they are interested in so i really appreciate your time on today's call and look forward to seeing you in a future event.